over to uh, 4 p.m. Victoria time. So uh, welcome everybody to our Australian Association for Environmental Education Learning Circle. It's a real pleasure to have such a great crew with us this afternoon, an international crew, which is very, very impressive. Um, some very important people to welcome to our session. The host and uh, a presenter for this evening is Cam McKenzie. Cam, thanks very much for joining us. Can you give us a wave? Great, thank you. Um, you might want to stop the screen share just for a moment. Okay. Thanks, perfect, So we, while we introduce people. So uh, Cam also has two special guests here this afternoon. Uh, he has Melanie Parker from Maryland in the US. Hi, hi Melanie. And he also has uh, Laura Collard, who's here with us also from the US. So these two special guests have got up in the middle of the night to be with us here t today. So we really thank you. That's super impressive. What a, what a fabulous effort. Um, we also have Mark Caddy, our president of A Squared E Squared with us. Hi, Mark. And I'm Peter White, and I'm the secretary of A Squared E Squared at the moment, and also the facilitator for this evening. So we have a, an hour and a half in which to host our learning circle. Um, I will just ask the other participants here to introduce themselves and then we'll move into our session. So Alex, maybe would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm going to say what, what I'm doing at Macquarie. Just, just yeah, a little quick hi and, and what you're up to. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Alex. I'm from Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia, and I'm looking at um, how well prepared pre-service teachers are to teach the sustainability cross-curriculum priority. Um, in Macquarie Uni. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. That's great. And Vicky? Yeah, so I'm Vicky Hartill. I work at the city of Coburn here in WA. And so I'm filling in for Claire Dunn, who's normally the state um, liaison for WA for A squared, E squared. Um, and yeah, so really excited to be here. Thanks for having me today. Fantastic, thank you, Vicky, for joining us. Um, we've got Simon Hum, who's just joined us. Can, Simon, we're just introducing ourselves. Would you like I've, to say a quick hi and who you are? I've timed it beautifully. You Can have? You hear me? Yes. Um, so I'm Simon from Sustainability Victoria. So I uh, work on the Resource Smart Schools program in Victoria. So always interested in that. And hello to Mark and Cam. Hello. <laughs> Great, and welcome. Thanks for coming along. And I, I missed out uh, David, who's on our uh, National Executive of A Squared, E Squared, and joining us from South Australia. So, hi, Dave. Dave's on mute, so we haven't had a... I, got, I, I, can, talk. I can talk, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, if yeah, I could just... Rem time on this. He's looking very relaxed there in his uh, casual gear. <laughs> If I could just uh, remind our, our participants, could you please mute your microphone when you're not speaking? It, it makes it a little easier to um, not have any background noise for the presenters. Uh, and with that, uh, other people will surely join us as we uh, kick into our presentation. So um, we'll just uh, maybe make a welcome to them at the end of the presentation now. But Cam, over to you if you would like to share your screen with us and kick into presentation. And just remember, we can see you while you're presenting. Okay, no picking the nose. Everybody, can you see that on the screen? Yeah. Thank you very much, Peter. Great introduction. And thank you guys for uh, participating in this uh, conversation around an experience that I was very, very blessed and um, privileged to have last year. Out of the blue somewhere, I got an invitation to participate in the showcasing of the Maryland Environmental Literacy Standards. The showcasing was hosted by the World Futures Council, World Future Council which is um, akin to a Nobel Peace Prize, but a, a different sort of more NGO basis. That's how they um, call themselves. So they go around the globe looking at policies, legislation that have a positive impact on young people. That's basically in a nutshell. And uh, through their uh, global scanning, they noticed that uh, in the US, there was a lot of uh, positive activity happening around the, uh, the state of Maryland with regards to embedding environmental education through these environmental literacy standards. 
So this is a combination of my observations, plus thank you very much, Laura and uh, Melanie for participating from Maryland to uh, give your reflections and, and perspectives too. There's a bit of a hidden agenda in this presentation. Great to have this conversation, but what could we do in Australia that could have some sort of um, uh, connection, relevance, impact from this, uh, this presentation? So a lot of people around the table will have a bit of a, because um, I didn't know the full audience, the invitation went out fairly wide. So a lot of the first few pres uh, slides I'm gonna show will be um, knowledge to most of you, not, not necessarily to our Maryland uh, friends, but I thought I'd start with this as a context. So uh, let's go. So a quick um, history around the Australian Cross Creek and Priorities of Sustainability. And I noticed our friend at uh, Macquarie University, my uh, daughter did her degree and master's there at Macquarie University. So uh, great, great uni. Uh, so this is a quick thumbnail sketch around where we've come to with our Cross Creek and Priorities. So back in April 2008, our Rudd government established the National Curriculum Board. That, more, that was informed by the uh, Melbourne Declaration. In the Melbourne Declaration, we had those two statements. There's gonna be a focus on environmental sustainability will be integrated across the curriculum. I always happened to be in the central office of our department at the time where we were actually scoping that out and I actually put that, that statement in there. So I was very pleased to see it in writing when it came back into the Melbourne Declaration. And the other statement out of the Melbourne Declaration was active informed citizens. It was actually just um, informed citizens. I actually advocated for the active part, so that was included as well. Uh, to work for a common good, in particular, sustaining and improving the natural and social environments. The National Curriculum Board changed to the National, uh, the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority, ACARA, in May 2009. And um, it oversees the, the, uh, the implementation of a national-wide curriculum initiative. So that, that's a little bit of a quick history, a bit further. Um, um, David would recall this and Mark would, would also. We had a National Council on Education for Sustainability and their focus was advocating for embedding environmental sustainability in the Australian curriculum. And Mark, I think you may have been at the meeting with Rob Randall in Sydney in September the 16th, 2009. I thought that was a seminal meeting where it was basically a lot of pushback. Oh no, we don't want to have this thing called environmental sustainability, even though the Melbourne Declaration had it written in there as a, um, a guiding principle. But uh, that meeting was fairly, uh, fairly forthright, and I think assertive in getting some sort of traction. And then we had these various drafts of the cross curriculum priorities. I, I've got documentation to say they were actually initially called dimensions, then they became perspectives, and finally cross curriculum priorities, and there are three of them. We had Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures, Australia and the Asia Pacific uh, area, and sustainability. So that's a quick thumbnail sketch around that bit of history. Then I felt that, well, that's sort of the um, bureaucratic process. What about the informing documents? Mark would recall this particular document. It was published once, and I've tried to find the publishing site, but I think it's disappeared. And Mark, I do uh, pay uh, tribute to you. I think I've taken this from one of your presentations in the past. But the document that New South Wales Department of Education and Communities back in 2009 was in the process of developing and drafting was called Earth Citizenship, Conceptual Framework for Learning for Sustainability. I believe it was published, but Mark, can you help me out? It was actually formally published uh, it was formally published, Cam. I will find uh, where it is. It, it's no longer on the Department of Education uh, website, um, but I will find where it is and get that um, to everyone. Excellent, because I do uh, acknowledge it was an absolute seminal document. I haven't seen an education department document that references Gaia as a concept and it's so well scoped. I believe, and please help me out, uh, David and Mark, because we were around at the same time. I felt that was very much a, an influencing document to the next one, which we're going to talk about, and that's the um, sustainability in the curriculum guide. So it had this great uh, um, conceptual map around social systems and technologies, ecological systems and processes. It was like a vortex that um, uh, um, Mr. Butler, not David, it was... Um, Kevin, Kevin Butler was the uh, main architect behind this one. So had these concentric circles, a really good um, concept that was then used as a foundation document, which I think was the most informative one. And that's this one here on uh, sustainability curriculum framework, a guide for curriculum developers and policy makers. So that previous one that New South Wales had drafted, and I don't think it was published in 2009, it was published later, 
it actually informed this particular document, which was well uh, scoped through the uh, National Council for Education and Sustainability and the, um, the National Environmental Education Network and others at that, at that forum. So back in 2010, this was written so that it could inform the curriculum writers for the Australian Curriculum Authority and Assessment, uh, ACARA, and um, great document. But then as things happen, it got whittled down to nine dot points, the sustainability organising ideas. So in the three cross curriculum priorities, we have these as the organising ideas. You can see the influence from the um, Earth Citizenship, Earth citizenship um, document in this area that there's three overarching concepts of systems, worldviews and futures, which very much parallel the previous document. And within each of those, we've got organising ideas and they are sort of higher order concepts. So you've got organising idea, one biodiversity is a dynamic system. You can read those out there. All life forms and sustainable patterns of living, that's in systems thinking. And the next one is worldviews, worldviews that recognise the dependence on living things as healthy ecosystems. And um, also worldviews are formed as by, by experiences with the personal, social and uh, local, national and global levels. Linked to the individuals and communities for actions for sustainability. And the, and the final one is futures, that's futures thinking. And for those who are fully aware of this, they're pretty well um, uh, understand it, but there's a quick list there. So I went from that great document from New South Wales to this informative document to inform policy advisors to nine dot points. And uh, uh, please apologies, my our friend from Macquarie University. Yes, if you'd like to jump in here at any stage and say, what's your research finding with regards to embedding that in uh, pre-service teachers? Have you got some input there, some indicative findings? Uh, I haven't actually found anything yet because I've just started this year. Okay. Yeah. I, I can almost, almost preempt what the outcome will be, minimal. Yeah, um, sorry. It got, it got diluted so much, it got down to nine. And actually, in fact, it was 10 uh, organising ideas initially and it got whittled back to nine. So that's a bit of a, a quick helicopter view thumbnail sketch for our, especially for our two Maryland uh, our colleagues to say this is where Australia has got to with regards to embedding and sustainability into our formal Australian curriculum. So now help me out here, US colleagues. I'm just doing a quick helicopter view of um, what I've uh, picked up with regards to um, the uh, US examples so of environmental education in the United States of America. In 1990, uh, I think it was one of the first countries in the world had an Environmental Education Act. The Act is part of the Environmental Protection Authority Act, so it was in the EPA. It was very much inform informative for the New South Wales, who actually had in 1994, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, I think it was about 94, there was a New South Wales Environmental Education Act, is that right? Uh, yeah, not uh, 89. 89, okay, okay. It might have been around the same time as the conversation for the US one, but... There's uh, one jurisdiction in Australia, that's New South Wales, that has an Environmental Education Act, once again, in an environment portfolio, USA, and there are seven other countries, or six other countries around the world, uh, according to some research by the Global Environmental Education Partnership member from Japan, he's done a, a global scan, and there are seven, maybe eight or nine, as we did the scan, we found out another couple of nations that have an Environmental Education Act. And I think the majority, if not all, are embedded within the, within the environment um, jurisdiction or portfolio. So they're an EPA or an Environment Department uh, Act. And then in 2009, um, the Obama administration proclaimed the No Child Left Inside Act. And the next few dot points are just basically the higher order uh, extracts from that particular act. And there's the, uh, the link there to the RL. So the first one is, it amends the elementary and secondary school education act. So now this is now embedded in the education um, uh, portfolio, not in the environment. So it amends the uh, education, elementary and secondary education act of 1965 to require states as a prerequisite, prerequisite to receiving implementation grants. So they have some funding comes from the federal to develop environmental liter literacy plans approved by the secretary of education federally for pre-kindergarten through to grade 12 that include environmental education standards and teacher training. That's the first of the uh, higher order dot points under this act. The second one is 
direct the Secretary to award environmental education professional development grants to states and through them, competitive sub-grants to partnerships in that include, and uh, help me out, I couldn't find the actual, I think that's uh, the LEA, uh, Maryland people, can you help me out what LEA stands for? That's Local Education Authority. And just to, to, to if you don't mind, Cam, I'm just gonna update yes. a little bit on this. Um, the No Child Left Inside uh, bill was passed in the Senate, but it was not constructed as an entire bill. What it was right. done is it was incorporated in with the new environmental, uh, I'm sorry, the education, elementary, secondary, and edu uh, education act. So now basically it's been incorporated in that. So we have this federal law that has funds, we hope, <laughs> that will be available to our local education agencies that can um, then submit to get funds to help with environmental education as one of these kind of 21st century possibilities. So it's a, it's a, it's lumped in with some other ones, but we're happy to see that it's actually in there. So. Thank you. And then the final one is this one here about um, advancing content and achievement standards. So that's the sort of the, the hook. So the, what I got from my visit is that I'm looking at the line of sight between the federal um, uh, acts in the environment and education, and then all the way through down to the states and territories. So then we come down to Maryland. And again, Maryland people, I'm very pleased to hear you can help me out. COMA is the, uh, the acronym for the legislative processes within the state of Maryland. And uh, this particular uh, number, 13A, 4.17.01, basically states that environmental education structural programs for grades pre-kindergarten to 12, and this is the actual overarching act, that each local school system shall provide a public, in public schools a comprehensive multidisciplinary environmental education program infused with current curriculum offerings and aligned with the Maryland's environmental literacy curriculum. Next one uh, point, I think there's about four of these. The Maryland Environmental Education Program shall provide a, de a developmentally appropriate instructional program, advance students' knowledge, confidence, skills, and motivation to make decisions and take actions that create and maintain an optimal relationship between themselves and the environment, and preserve and protect the unique natural resources of Maryland, particularly, and this is the part I really love, those around the Chesapeake Bay and the watershed. So it's not just about content, it's about making some commit commitment to protect a, a fantastic natural has, uh, asset and habitat. And I think there are seven states that border the Chesapeake Bay. Is that right, guys? That's correct. <laughs> yeah, so the seven states that border this beautiful part of the world. And now you've got an educational um, focus on protecting that uh, watershed and that catchment area. And the third one is a comprehensive instructional program that provides for the diversity of student needs, abilities and interests at the early, middle and high school levels and shall include all standards from the Maryland Environmental Literacy Curriculum as set forth in the regulations. So that's the Higher Order Act. So there's a federal act, there's a state act. So you can see this line of sight happening. This is what, this is just a slight little extract from a document that's available online. This is the part that really excited me. There's something that you, you, you hope that it will be taken all the way down the food chain. I was super impressed with the superintendents who uh, attended the uh, forums who had that dead set commitment, not just within their own patch, when they moved patch, they went to an, the superintendent, um, uh, Laura and Melanie, his name is? Kevin Maxwell. Dr. Kevin Maxwell. Maxwell. Just so dynamic, passionate, committed. So it's taking the legislation and the regulations and the intent of the policy and really pushing it through the entire school community. So the superintendent is of the, um, of the district, is that right? Yes, yeah, so one of the county districts. Yeah, so in the county and under the state, you've got county and the districts, just pushing this agenda all the way through, passionate, committed, taking it on board, it's just fantastic. And here are the standards. I might step back from this bit. Now we've got the two experts over there. And <laughs> I didn't, uh, Melanie, change the uh, standards if you go. I'll just skip a couple of points here. Because you go to standards, see standard eight there. Underneath each standard, there are topics and there are indicators. So I didn't flesh out all of them because it would take forever to copy out. But if I just ask our two colleagues 
to just walk us through what they are. And I think, Melanie, you said earlier that the environmental issues is the one that is a, a driving force. I'll step out, out of the conversation here and give it over to the experts. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so we have uh, eight kind of overarching standards, and each one of those are addressing um, different parts. So a number of them are what I would consider content standards, uh, especially, like, as you can see, interactions of Earth systems and flow of matter and energy. Uh, the first standard, though, I'm going to kind of point out because that one in particular uh, is different, say, than some of our science standards or social studies standards that they might have already in their coursework or content. The environmental issues one basically has uh, the necessity for students to investigate an environmental issue and then take action. And I think that take action piece is probably the most valuable piece because it says that you need to do something, right? Not just, uh, not just learn about it. Um, so that one has really been a kind of a driving force within our school district uh, in kind of setting the stage of why we need to be doing this and we're not just doing it already. Um, Cause I think that's what uh, some of our content areas are like, well, it's in there, but uh, this part is not. So we've used that as a way to make sure that we kind of leverage this a little bit more Oh, within the school systems themselves. And I would, I would add to that, Melanie, that um, the, the non-formal providers, um, we've been able to work with the school systems to support with the environmental issues component um, and, and really encourage that action, uh, well, the investigation and, and action. And then the other thing that I would say is that, and, and I know this is kind of jumping maybe a little bit, but with the next generation science standards that were introduced in the last um, two years, that that, uh, that be, uh, became um, a component of the science standards as well. So that then you have the um, environmental issues investigation um, and, uh, and action uh, now being more substantially um, carried into uh, the learning standards, the other uh, standards that, um, that students have or that teachers are responsible for delivering. So yeah, can we flesh that out a bit more? There seems to be a, a, um, a matrix there between the various uh, subject uh, standards, you know, math, English, social studies and the like, and then the environmental literacy. How do they sort of intersect? Give us some of the indications of that. And we'll just flick through a couple of the other standards while we're doing that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, one of the things that's been happening, at least for Maryland and, and in the United States, is that there has been a kind of a turnover in regard to new curricular standards and those types of things. So within the past 10 years, I guess I could say, maybe, maybe even less, uh, we've had a complete overhaul with math. We call it uh, Common Core Math and Common Core Reading. Um, so both of those were, were introduced and it was a different approach, different pedagogy on how we teach some of these types of things. Um, with that, then we now have the, the next generation science standards. So this is a new, new uh, group of standards for science. And again, it's, it's a pedagogical change in, in how we're approaching uh, teaching. And it really has been, uh, it's been hard <laughs> in regard to teachers because it's, it's a different way of kind of looking at um, how we're teaching our students. And then uh, we also have uh, new social studies standards as well, which is interesting enough as one of their um, core components, there is citizen action as a piece of that. So a lot of um, the, the new things that have been going on with the curriculum changes really has made it, I don't wanna say easier, but made it, made it um, easier to integrate the environmental literacy and doing some of the um, action components um, because the students are then able to integrate what they're doing. Uh, so we really kind of push the, the multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary aspect of the environmental literacy um, standards so that we can kind of get the standards in, but we can also kind of have them look at it in, in different perspectives. And the, and the new standards and stuff have in some ways helped with that. It's given us a little bit more um, freedom and match and what we would think is good pedagogy anyway. Um, now it's a little bit more, a lot more um, 
a lot more engaging and doing um, as opposed to just looking at the content. Thank you. And that's the fully fleshed uh, standard aid on sustainability. So that's what they look like in the um, in their standards documentation. So that's a, a, a quick look across there and if you see a lovely <laughs> melody there. <laughs> didn't, I didn't know if you were able to join us. I put a photo of you there. And that's Melanie's um, title. You can see it's a combination of both uh, coordinated literacy standards and also principal of the Outdoor Education Centre at uh, Arlington Echo. So uh, I felt a lot of uh, connection with your role there, Melanie, with what I did when I was in, uh, in the central office of our department. I was doing a bit of both too, principal and policy advisor. Can you give us uh, some insights as to how this looks in the classroom with regards to embedding it? So if um, what I'd like to do is kind of take you through uh, how it works. So at the state level down to our uh, county based uh, district school district levels, because basically we had this new policy that, you know, says, OK, we have a high school graduation requirement and we need to be embedding these standards so that we have these great students that are you know, going out there and saving the world. Um, and we really wanted to, uh, with that, that did not come with any kind of support regard, in regard to the districts. So basic says you need to do it. And then um, each county district or school district needed to kind of figure out how they were gonna do that. So it kind of depended on the resources that they had. To give a little bit of background on um, Maryland in regard to the environment, uh, Maryland counties and school districts have had outdoor centers and environmental education centers uh, at, in many of their school districts. And that's not true in other states especially, um, but we've been pretty, uh, pretty fortunate to have um, you know, these around, for example, my center has been around for 50 years. We celebrate 50 years next year, um, as well as a number of the other school systems also have embedded centers within their school district. Um, so, you know, there was some framework that already kind of existed to really take what we were doing already and then be able to kind of justify in some ways by having these standards, um, you know, what we're, what we, what, what we're doing. So um, each district had to basically develop their own plan on how they were going to implement it, you know, depending on their resources. Um, we're really, you know, for example, when we, when we talk about our school districts, um, in particular in, in Anne Arundel County, my school district, we have uh, 82,000 students that we serve. Um, with about 120 um, facilities, 80 elementary schools, uh, that's pre-K to fifth grade, and then uh, 20 middle schools, so that's sixth through eighth, and then uh, 12 high schools. So just kind of give you a little bit of the, the scope. Um, the way we kind of took those standards and implemented it within our curriculum is we basically decided that every single grade level needs to have some sort of environmental literacy unit um, and that's embedded within the curriculum. So as you saw earlier, it needs to be infused with uh, our curricular standards. So I don't have a separate coursework or a fleet of teachers that are out there teaching environmental literacy in the classroom, um, but the curriculum itself is developed to have an environmental focus and environmental literacy unit in which they take some sort of action. Um, so that's pretty neat when we have 6,000 kids out there uh, taking action for habitat or uh, recycling or plastics or whatever it is. Um, so we work with the different content areas and what's nice about being part of the school system, I think that's an advantage that we have, is that we're able to really um, work within the school district to write the curriculum for it. So I work with the science department and the social studies department and the math department to develop these uh, environmental literacy units and then they're embedded into science or social studies depending on the content and how it matches up with the standards. So we really looked at the standards and said, okay, where do we see this um, at the different grade levels? So we're not teaching all of the standards or all of the indicators 
at every single grade. That, that wouldn't happen. And when you look at the standards themselves, they're really written for the 12th grade. So we have not differentiated for the different uh, grade level bands or anything like that. We just, we just said, okay, they're teaching this you know, for science in uh, third grade. So we're going to be, you know, embedding um, the environmental literacy standards with that and in, in incorporating uh, an appropriate uh, action and invest issue investigation for that grade level. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the basic, uh, how we made it work. Um, and we've had, you know, very good success with uh, each one of our grades. So we have a combination of having an environmental literacy unit where the teachers are teaching the, the unit um, with uh, doing experiences, whether it is with our center, um, you know, the, in my department in regard to our programs, or they might be working with a nonprofit where they would also, you know, be able to do uh, some of that as, there as well. Um, so with our center, we, we have, uh, we see the students in kindergarten, uh, fourth grade, fifth grade, and sixth grade. Um, and in all the other units, we also try to incorporate a lot of uh, getting outdoors and using the outdoors uh, for teaching these things. Because um, I think that that's one of our aspects that I think that are, are missing. And, and I know uh, uh, the person that's doing the uh, pre-service teaching, I I understand that completely because even though we've had these standards as part of our um, as part of our policy in education, there's still no pre-service uh, requirement in environmental literacy. So um, that's still a struggle that we're still working with, um, and we're working on it slowly. But uh, it takes a little time to to get through all of the policy pieces and the and the uh, the standards that they have for the pre-service teaching as well. So that's a quick rundown. Um, I'll definitely take any, any questions or anything, you know, on that. We're, we're going to keep going and have lots of questions as we go through. Um, one point that we did uh, omit to say at the beginning is that these standards are what students should know and be able to do by year 12. So it's the actual um, uh, standards at that point. But as uh, Melanie said, it's about the transition, uh, the journey through that time as well. So they're, what they're, they're able to achieve at the uh, final year of school. So I might just move on to the next part here, and here it is. Was that what you were talking about? I should have clicked it on. Yeah, I didn't, know, I didn't know if you had my slides or not. I there did, you go. I put it in. So there's, the, there's the, uh, the steps that Melanie just talked through. Yeah. The, the other thing I would add, Cam, is that yes. um, what Melanie was saying about the um, no, no pre-service for teachers. So the school districts have had to work um, on professional development for teachers, and they have a variety of ways of delivering that. Some is done in, in the school district, and other is looking for opportunities um, for teachers um, that's provided by other by other providers, um, and they have a partnership with with several providers or Chesapeake Bay Foundation in particular um, that's been supportive of helping teachers to be able to provide this curriculum that they've developed. I think that's a nice segue towards this. This is uh, the model, the Maryland's Environmental Literacy Standards Partnership Model. So I might ask if. Laura, can you, you talk about the anchor and the issues and the civic engagement? I'm going to let Melanie do that. <laughs> okay, yeah, ping pong, okay. Uh, so, um, so basically as a kind of a, that what came out of, you know, some of the needs of the different districts was the need to be able to um, really look at embedding and getting environmental literacy standards into especially the high school level. And through a grant, uh, some of our partners that are you know, nonprofits, uh, specifically the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, um, partnered to, with a number of the school districts to have teachers come together and write curriculum um, for, uh, basically they really were focused on those um, courses in high school in which almost every single student takes. So for example, every student takes uh, biology. And so embedding the curriculum into that. 
So as a kind of a, you know, a, the fruit of some of that labor and going through that process, uh, this uh, environmental literacy model, the ELM model was kind of developed. And that was kind of a framework for how do we, how do we write these units? How do, we, um, how do we make sure that we have all the pieces in there that we can, um, you know, make it work? So basing it on our curriculum, um, and that's not only environmental literacy uh, anchors in regard to our curriculum anchors, but also um, our science or social studies anchor, and then taking that and doing an issues investigation, really kind of diving in deep in regard to uh, having students engaged in looking at those different pieces of, you know, what is the issue that, that, that they're focused on, and then, you know, working through uh, you know, who are the stakeholders involved? Um, what kinds of pieces? What kind of research can we do on this? What, are, what has been going on in regard to the history and the, and the aspects of this? And then how do we learn more about it? Like, what's going on now? You know, what kind of data can we collect um, to figure out the scope or the, you know, the, you know, the breadth of, of what's happening in this issue? Um, and then what can we do about it? And that's that, again, that's that action piece where you know, how can we go and take action to, um, you know, to help mitigate or to inform um, or restore whatever piece it, it might be um, to kind of, you know, kind of fill that out. And so this has been a, a really nice because this really did kind of come through, you know, a number of different school districts, but it also engaged with uh, a lot of our community partners partners and community, I mean, in the broader sense in that we have a number of environmental education uh, nonprofits that um, provide environmental education experiences um, and or support, like, like with Laura's, she's our, you know, with, with the, our Maryland Association, um, you know, support the schools in a number of different ways. And having this is kind of a model that um, whether teachers use it or our school systems use it as a way to kind of get in all of those pieces that we want to see in kind of an ideal um, environmental education unit or environmental literacy unit. How's that? <laughs> Did I hit it all, Laura? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's good, Melanie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and really, uh, what what she was going through is really that transition and and having a, a structure that teachers can use. And the 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 part that that I have worked with um, across the state is really that um, uh, recognition that there are partners to support the school districts with this. Um, and so we have. Um, Organ, environmental organizations across the state. Some of them, like um, Melanie's, is um, an outdoor ed center that is part of the school system, but then so many more that, um, that can provide either opportunities at their sites or what they started to do within the last five years was recognize that, and this is a kind of a side issue, but that um, there wasn't funding for field trips um, to their sites in, uh, in the way that they would have liked. And so they started being able to go into the classroom and work with um, teachers in the classroom. And then, and then that actually supported some of the, um, the trips out to the site, out to the outdoors. But we've done a lot of really um, encouraging uh, organizations to go into the schools, working with the schools on the school grounds, um, and then um, uh, it really supporting that curriculum and the anchors and all of that, that that Melanie and the school districts were responsible for delivering. Thank you, Laura. And this is the motley mob of those people who are invited to the uh, showcasing in Annapolis and the beautiful Chesapeake Bay in the background. Laura, refresh my memory, was it 14 countries, 16 countries? No, it was closer to 20. 20, 20 countries were invited from Abu Dhabi to um, Central America to UK to uh, Europe, Australia, there were two Aussies there. And um, there was a, yep, yeah, from all around the globe to get the insights to showcase this best practice. So as part of that, um, that one, yeah, one week uh, workshop, we went out and did field trips. 
And this is the one to a place called Arlington Echo. That looks familiar. And uh, you can see the traditional, um, um, uh, well, they all arrive on those lovely yellow buses. And uh, you've got the students engaged in uh, hands-on activities doing the water quality monitoring and uh, a great experience there for the day where the students are doing uh, a focus on their uh, environmental literacy through action and activity on site. Also went to this place called the Jessabeeks Bay Foundation. Absolutely awesome. I think it's a, I'll have to excuse you for a minute. We've got a plane taking off outside the window, so apologies for that background noise. So Cam, this is the Chesapeake Bay Foundation building and it is a LEED uh, standard building um, that has the... Um, I think it's a platinum, isn't know. it? Platinum LEED? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's uh, like our Green Star, Six Star rating in Australia. Absolutely phenomenal facility. And they're a partner in the whole process of uh, supporting the environmental literacy through professional development of teachers and also uh, student engagement we saw at the end of a student trip at that location. That's where we had most of our uh, workshop in that building there uh, for part of the presentation. And this is the part that really did excite me from the point of view from the federal to the state to the county to the district to the school to the individual student. This strapping young lad here, he would be six foot six. He's taller than I was and he was so passionate about his commitment to an environmentally sustainable and environmental literacy in the school. I walked through with him on the school trip and you can see the, um, there's the, uh, the Maui uh, logo there for the, uh, the Maryland Outdoor and Environmental Education Association is supporting that through their green school. I'll ask you to talk about this school in a minute, uh, Laura. So I asked this young gentleman here with all these uh, indicators of uh, success. Oh, first of all, that, those, uh, those two bins there, the recycling, the trash. He was noticing that the, um, the janitor, when she was trying to empty it, was finding it very difficult to get the, the bins in and out. And um, he actually modified a side door to it. So he actually took, took it home, measured it up, put in a side door, hinged and brought it back to school. So we're walking around the school grounds and I, I looked him up in the eye and I said, um, oh, you play for the, um, the Broadneck High School, are they the Bears? No, what, what's their, um, their football team? I know I should know that. I'm, that's one of my schools, but uh, yeah. well, yeah, I think, I think have a like a bear. <laughs> yeah, I think they're the Bears. I said, "Oh, what position do you play on the Bears team?" He said, "I can't play football. I haven't got, got time. I am volunteering for the Jessabeeks Bay Foundation on the weekends. I'm doing a university degree already in environmental science. My direction is set. I'm going to be in, in this pathway." So um, he was dead set committed. So Laura, you, you know this school, obviously. It's very well. Um, uh, receiving the uh, your support. Give us some, some insights as to what the, the school's doing. Well, um, actually, it's one of Melanie's schools, so she, she oh, knows yeah. backwards and forwards. But I will just say a teeny little bit about the Maryland Green School program. The flag is in that cafeteria towards the back. It's a white circle on it. Right, thanks, Cam. Um, and uh, the Maryland Green School program, um, it, it runs throughout the... Um, throughout the state, we have 560 schools, and this is one of our, our kind of showcase schools. Um, it has a passionate lead teacher um, who, uh, who is working in her school to see that um, environmental literacy is happening. But Melanie will tell you just a little bit, it is um, a specialty school for Anne Arundel County. Um, but within the Maryland Green School program, um, there are three objectives. The first one is um, integrated curriculum, which is much easier now that the environmental literacy um, requirement is in place. Um, the second objective is student actions in seven sustainable environmental best management practices. And so he's showcasing one of them, which is waste management. Um, and it is student driven, um, so students have to be involved in those um, eight actions that they have to turn in in the application. And then the third objective is community partnerships. And um, you can see on the poster there some of the partners I believe they've been working with, but certainly um, uh, that they have to demonstrate that they have partners working with them at the school, but then also show how they are um, uh, showing the community, either supporting the community or informing the community about the practices that they do. 
Um, Melanie, do you want to tell them a little bit about um, Broadneck as um, an environmental sh showcase school for you? Yeah, so um, but the way in, in our school district, we have what's called signature overlays. Um, and for this particular high school, their signature is environmental literacy. Um, so as part of the uh, curricular piece that they do at the, at the school base level is they have overlays for different courses that focus on environmental literacy topics and those types of things. So their overarching theme throughout the school is environmental literacy, um, which is pretty exciting. And with the partners, they do a various different things in regard to um, addressing environmental issues and actually learning a lot about uh, their local environment. And they can't do it without those partners. They do a lot with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, um, having forums and those types of things for the students to discuss environmental issues and, and learn about career opportunities and, and um, really have um, kind of that connection with the local, the, the local uh, what's going on locally in regard to the environmental um, issues and um, those partners. Uh, the other piece with this too, they're actually a green ribbon school, which is at the federal level. Um, so I've stepped up above the, uh, the state level, though we claim that ours is, is, um, is just as rigorous <laughs> for the state level. Um, but uh, they wouldn't get it unless they had ours, I don't think. Uh, so the, um, so they are going to, you know, so their whole focus on the school is really about the environment and it's a pretty exciting uh, uh, place when you, when you can and go there and, and see that, you know, the students are really engaged with, um, you know, this is part of their, their, their kind of daily routine. Melanie and uh, Laura, can you expand on the Green Ribbon School concept at the federal level? Okay, yeah, Laura. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, about four years ago, um, across the nation, a group got together and decided that there needed to be national recognition for schools and developed three pillars. Um, the first pillar has to do with um, the building and facilities and cost savings efficiencies in energy, water, and waste. Um, and the second pillar has to do with the health, the health of the school as well as the health of the student. And the third pillar has to do with environmental literacy. Um, and so schools now are nominated by the State Departments for Education um, and uh, they can nominate up to five schools uh, a year, but most states are not nominating that many. Uh, Maryland this year, I believe, had two schools uh, that were nominated, but um, Broadneck High School is an example of a green ribbon school in Maryland. And uh, Anne Arundel County, we also have district uh, recognition uh, for districts that are, um, uh, have developed sustainability. Um, it's not really, well, I guess Anne Arundel County has a sustainability plan, but it has to do with sustainable education, and practices. And so Anne Arundel County is one of those uh, recognized uh, winners as well. Um, and I would say, I think Maryland has probably in four years um, about 10, uh, 10 schools and three districts um, that have been recognized nationally. Um, don't know if there's anything you want to add, Melanie, for that. Is that a uh, lead initiative by the Environment um, Ministry? No, it's education. It's education, that's right. It's, it's education. But it was done in coordination with the EPA, but there were some... Uh, uh, there, it's an unfunded mandate, and for some reason, EPA uh, pulled back a little bit in terms of... Um, running the program. So the Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Education uh, runs that program. And, uh, but we have been able, last year we actually had the EPA Region 3 Administrator at our Youth Summit where we recognized the, na uh, the National Green Ribbon School winners as well as our own Green School uh, awardees for the year. Um, and so that was that was really nice to have EPA there and, and recognizing the work that the schools are doing. 
Excellent. Thank you, ladies. And if there was time, I don't know if we can show these videos. I'll just give it a go. Let's have a look. Yeah, the uh, World Future Council has put together some really nice videos. Um, yeah. Which yeah, so uh, for the past 14 years, Can you see that? Uh, we've been looking at uh, uh, different ways of getting kids engaged outside um, and interacting mm -hmm. with their media environment and their community. We can hear, but can't see it. Locally, but think globally. And so as long as we can teach them to be good stewards can you see of that? their own place, uh, that can be transferred yes. later on. A, a bigger, a much bigger picture. Yes. Well, more people, like more diversity, like more different kinds. You know, as the principal, and we, we talk about what how we're educating kids. It's not just about learning the facts, but it's about instilling good habits and in um, the right mindset that. We're all responsible for So I can't hear the video cam, um, but I can talk a little bit about uh, Dana, who's the principal the there. World, the real world. Okay, yep. What, what will get them there? Okay. So, um, Dana uh, McCauley is um, a fantastic principal teacher, she's called. She's in a very small school in western rural Maryland. And uh, she really has, um, it, her school is uh, the epitome of um, integrated curriculum and getting kids outside. Those kids uh, that were on the tour gave the tour and talked to the group of people do this on a regular basis, but talk to whoever visits about the um, wildlife that's there, um, pick uh, grasses out of, uh, out of the wetlands and have you taste it because it tastes like cucumber. Um, they have animals and farm, uh, they're growing vegetables that in the summer the community can eat. Um, and uh, chickens with eggs, but uh, they also have all of the integrated curriculum that Melanie was talking about. Um, and this is an elementary school with kids that are doing uh, research um, uh, on projects that, that you'd find in grades higher than that. By the time they get to fourth and fifth grade, um, they're uh, able to present um, they are inquisitive, they're learning, and I think they're going to be outstanding um, college students when they get there. And I'm hoping that um, in that county that the middle school and high school can support the kids coming out of that elementary school. It's just astonishing um, what they are able to do. Such a confident group of children in, as I said, a really rural area. Um, she has speakers come into that school on a regular basis, um, partners uh, from uh, various organizations in the area and then people who've retired out there. So scientists, um, you'll find them working uh, with the kids. Um, when I was there at one visit, they were installing um, a new sundial in the ground in the grass in front of the school. That was an interactive one that students would be able to to interact with and, and learn about uh, time and sun. I can't hear you, Cam. Sorry about that. I had it on mute because we have planes outside. So thank you very much for that. This is uh, sort of the end of the formal presentation. I might pass it back to, um, to and thank Melanie and Laura for now it's 1 a.m. in the morning over there. You guys must be super tired uh, for that excellent, made uh, the whole presentation so much more worthwhile than my boring old chats. Yeah, double thumbs up from everybody. Um, but open up now for general uh, conversations and um, we've got a list. I see the uh, list is growing there. So I'll flick it back to Peter who wants to, if you can facilitate some sort of a dialogue around uh, sharing ideas and um, the protocols and things like that, Peter. 
Great. Thanks very much, Cam. And again, you know, everyone thank Cam for pulling together such an amazing effort. It's fantastic. And um, also to Melanie and Laura, awesome effort getting up in the middle of the night just for us, feeling really pretty special. Would love to be able to engage in a bit of a conversation now. We've got, you know, a good 35 minutes left of our learning circle, which is fantastic. So for a protocol, I, I know this might feel a little primary school, but could we just raise our hand if we've got a question to ask? And then if it's okay, I, I will direct who can go and then as that conversation's wrapping up and you've got a question, just um, annotate somehow and, and we'll hopefully move on to you. So does anyone have a question that they would like to ask either or any of our presenters for this afternoon? Mark, okay, over to you. Um, <clears throat> Um, hi everyone, thank you very much you guys, I really love that. With the standards, um, if I've got this right, those standards are kind of like exit competencies for students once they get to the end of that, end of their, their schooling. How, how are teachers supported to, I suppose, backward map that to any of those year levels so that they can uh, I suppose, uh, I identify what is an appropriate level of achievement for the kids and put in place the appropriate or corresponding activities to reach those achievements or standards. So, uh, no one thing is that, uh, uh, at least within our school district, uh, we really do kind of map out the curriculum for the teachers. So, the teachers really aren't they do have their own freedom to do uh, stuff in regard to looking at the standard and deciding how they would implement that and assess that. Um, but it's really, it's really kind of laid out for them uh, within the curriculum. So when we uh, create that, we are basically, um, you know, putting in activities and assessments that are going to be uh, assessing that. Do we, we're not, in a, and again, it's embedded in with the say science or social studies um, as a way to integrate it in. Um, so we do not have specific, specific assessments for environmental literacy. Um, it's the act of actually doing them. Um, so we're still working on some of this, but uh, you know, it, it's the you know, fulfilling those standards and learning the standard uh, in the content in which, it, which it contains. So it's really not a, um, it's not up to individual teachers, uh, though I know some of our school districts operate slightly differently. Um, you know, so they're not having to kind of try to figure out how to work this all out and map it all out. Um, it's really up, you know, at the, um, at what we call our, 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 our content level, um, curriculum lo writing level um, that's pushed out to the teachers for, for all of the, the grade levels. So I would just add to that, Melanie, um, there isn't a test at the end, at the end of the schooling at, at 12th grade or 11th grade that says our students are now environmentally literate. It really is dependent on this curriculum that curriculum writers like your group that you have in Anne Arundel County have put together. And in each school district, as Melanie said, it is, um, it is slightly different. But, um, but it is a, a group of curriculum specialists that have worked to integrate the standards into science and into other uh, uh, social studies um, and, and sometimes into English language arts, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, teachers um, deliver this curriculum, but they can use different activities that they find and they're comfortable with. Um, and this is again where they bring in partners sometimes to help them to deliver that curriculum that's been laid out um, by the um, district. Thanks very much, Melanie and Laura. I really appreciate that. Um, before I came to questions, I, I meant to welcome a couple of our um, latecomers to the session. So Colin, fantastic to see you here. Shelley P, great to see you here. Uh, Nigel's just had to, oh, Nigel's back again. Nigel, we're just welcoming you. So fantastic that you're back and I hope you can hear us. And also Mandy, great to have you along. So thank you very much for joining. Um, we're just in the question part of the session, uh, but I would like to point out um, 
that while we've been presenting this afternoon, Natasha, who's our amazing administrative executive with A Squared E Squared, has already posted the presentation on our site, on the A Squared E Squared website, as well as a link to Maryland Environmental Literacy Standards. So if those kind of documentation to have in front of you, if that would be helpful, please note that you can find that from our website right now. Just go to our, our Learning Circles page. Are there any other questions for our presenters this afternoon? Simon, is that a question? No? No? Colin's got a question. How about we go to you, Colin? Uh, what happens if people have a plan and don't implement it? What's the level of compulsion? What's the level of, um, you know, want of a better word, policing? Or, yeah, what are the consequences? Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, there, there is a requirement as part of the policy uh, that we each school district reports every five years that they've met these requirements. We've had our first one, uh, when was it, Laura, a couple of years ago, um, in which we have to document as part of a school, as part of the school district, I have to document uh, where we are meeting the, the standards um, and at what grade levels. Um, this this was a five, the first five year thing, and a number of our school districts had not completely completed that. But it was it's a it's a work in progress. Um, so they're uh, you know they're still working towards that. But there is there is no stick uh, to this. Uh, it's it's basically did you complete it? And you know you guys better do better next time uh, kind of thing. Um, but that's 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 where we are right now. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I have a quick question, if that's okay. Go Cam, yes, that'd be yeah. great. Thank you. Um, ladies, I was fortunate to experience the fantastic presentation. Uh, pre a significant event that's happened in your country, what was that guy called? Um, oh, Trump. Has there been a, um, a post-Trump bump or what's happening with regards to the momentum of what you've been able to achieve? Uh, we want to stay under the radar screen. Let's just, uh, you know, um, right now, you know, there's, you know, there's, as you know, his first 100 days have been quite um, interesting. Uh, so uh, we're, we're still trying to hang on and, and see what, what's happening. Um, obviously, we're seeing um, some uh, issues in regard to our uh, Environmental Protection Agency and uh, National Park Service and a number of other um, environmental agencies that have, um, that now have some restrictions on funding or at least, you know, some, uh, they're, they're, they're putting a stop on things for now um, as they reassess things. Uh, we don't know what the fallout's gonna be. Um, we're kind of hoping we're we're kind of immune to that right now because we have policies in place already. Um, we don't see any reason why those policies would change. Uh, it would take quite a bit to uh, to to kind of un unhook those. Um, in Maryland, we're we're pretty uh, we're a very democratic state, uh, and though we have a Republican governor, um, so we're we do pretty well in regard to the environment. Um, but it is, I think everybody has some, some concern um, in regard to what could happen. But right now we're just, uh, we're, we're, we're see, we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> there was a reason for that question because um, if you said that the, there was a, a ch chance of falling apart, that'd be a worry, but you said it's set in policy, it's set in legislation, so it takes a lot to unravel that. I think that's the key difference. Our, our system we don't have a lot of that rigor around that so i throw it back to our aussie colleagues and saying well hearing that story what do you think we could do not so much the duplicate but things that we we could do because if you look at our association over the couple of decades the late 90s we advocated for the national action plan for environmental education yay we've got a great national action plan achieved a lot of outcomes and around the um the 2000s we had the second national action plan as part of the un decade 2006, I think, was released. Yay, we had the second one. But now 2017, and I think we're at a bit of a, um, a, a down in the in the up and down trough with regard with regards to uh, momentum. And that's what I got out of the Maryland experience, that the locking it into legislation and into policy and into procedures that are sort of a hard to unravel 
Aussies, um, over to you. What 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 can you learn and what can we uh, suggest around uh, ways forward for Australia? Yes, uh, Colin. I, I, sorry, Peter. Yeah, Colin's got his hand up. You're uh, on mute. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that we did in the tertiary sector was, uh, and it came out of a conference with the ACS Australian Australian campuses towards sustainability, was uh, a what we an unofficially called a a sandbagging strategy. That is. Uh, we kind of identified that we weren't going to make much more progress, but what we tried to do was to set up some processes where we at least uh, kept the linkages alive. Uh, and we got a grant to do some of that. And also uh, a lot of the information and ideas uh, went to places so that if they were taken away centrally, they could at least be retrieved. And it's, you know, sometimes it's a little bit, um, what's the word? Uh, harrowing when you find that things are actually suddenly taken down. This happened in the UK with their health, uh, with their national, the the um, national health um, scheme. There had a great sustainability website, and it got taken down, like just like that, with a change of government. So that's something from this end that might be worth thinking about, and trying to develop independent linkages that aren't necessarily dependent on on government, even if a lot of the work is being done through government. Um, yeah, so that just, you know, another one was uh, AESA, which was um, partly focused around collecting together the ideas and resources, but it was also uh, a way of lots of different groups collaborating. And when uh, sustainable schools, resource smart schools got challenged in Victoria and there was going to be a gap and it was going to fall apart, there was a very coordinated, large-scale effort in Victoria to make sure that that continued. It wouldn't have. It would have had a would have had a eight-month or a year gap while they, the new government invented their own version of it, and lots of people would have got damaged. So there are some potential ways of thinking about that. Thanks, Colin. Um, Simon, you've got some Victorian things to add. I have, and uh, know Colin well, so uh, it's always good to see other Victorians on the line. Um, look, there's a few different things. I'm lucky enough in that I sit in the government space, but I'm also lucky enough to get out to a lot of schools. Um, and that's, uh, I think it was Mark said before, or oh, actually, no, sorry, it was Cam, I apologise. Uh, the curriculum here, it's, there's been a bit of um, doubt in Victoria around whether the cross curricular priorities were going to continue. And so we were seeing that, it, um, uh, pre-service teachers, there was some training going on for, uh, in past years, but in the last couple of years, while there's been this sort of hesitation at government level, quite a few universities seem to have dropped that off. But when you go out to schools, there is some really amazing um, literacy happening. Um, VCAR in Victoria have just released a document when they have worked very closely with us and with uh, EEV, which is the Victorian Association for Environmental Education. Um, but it does worry me. Uh, it's great to hear that in Maryland, it, it, it sort of it's it, it's a bit like the English system by the sounds of things. In that it's you know the the county controls it and basically says to the school you must deliver this. Whereas we have a very loose framework, and and that always worries me. In that you know some schools can tick it off and they're doing it at a very shallow level, and then you go to another school. Um, we've got some amazing schools, a bit like the ones that we talked about before. Um, uh, Winters Flat in uh, Castlemaine, Victoria is one that uh, comes to mind where it really is embedded in the kids. They know it, they go out, they live it, they breathe it. Um, and it's, it's, the, it's the individual teachers and the passion there that happens. But there's schools down the road that are saying they're doing the same sort of thing and it's nothing like the same sort of level. So that's where my concern comes from. And I'd sort of like to hear from Marilyn uh, any advice they have on, on how we can strengthen that because I mean I know it's the way the Australian system works that we develop these curriculum standards and then we hand them over and let schools do whatever but it seems to be too loose and it sounds to me like Marilyn's got the balance right between the uh, standard and giving people something that they can work with but still have some flexibility in. so I've sort of got a bit of a question there and a bit of a information about what we're doing. So I've got to go sorry thanks for this. <laughs> Yeah, Simon, I, I would say that the, um, 
I, you know, I, it is it is in good faith that that we're taking these standards um, that are our requirements and implementing them at the school level. Each district does something different, and I, you know, it's hard to say whether uh, they're doing it with fidelity. Um, you know, I know that some, some school districts would uh, just have a, they say, well, it's a high school graduation requirement, we're going to have a high school course in environmental science, and we're done. Um, we, we did have some school districts that, that kind of did that, especially some of our smaller ones. Um, and then others that really kind of fully developed it uh, in other ways. And I think, again, that some of this has to do with our history in that we had um, a long-term support within the school systems themselves with the outdoor education centers and environmental education programs that I think really helped build that uh, in there. Um, so I think, I think that's part of it. Uh, you know, having, you know, for, you know, I've been in, in at our f facility for 20 years and, uh, you know, having this policy that says uh, you need to do this or you're supposed to do this uh, really legitimized what we're doing with them with, you know, with what we've been doing all along. Right, we've been we've been the, the folks that play in the woods. You know, you probably know have that out there too. <laughs> but uh, we're always, you know, like you know, you guys just have fun out there, and you know, it was never it was never seen as kind of a serious thing. And I think now with this policy, we're really seen as it's a much more legitimate. Uh, you know, we're part of our content, right? We're the same as science and social studies and language arts and math. We have these standards that say they must be taught. Uh, so that just having that policy uh, really, really made that difference, I think, and into where it's not kind of brushed aside. I mean, we've always had to deal with, you know, funding issues in regard to environmental education programs. Um, it'll be a little bit harder, uh, I think, now for uh, somebody to say, oh, we don't need the environmental education program um, because, because we can say, well, we have this, this policy that, that says we need to be teaching this. So, and I was thinking, you know, um, earlier, Cameron, you are talking about fallout from uh, the Trump administration. Um, uh, just what, one of the points that Laura made, you know, a lot of our funding um, to support environmental education programs has been through grants, and a lot of those have been federal grants. Um, we have some small local grants, but the, the larger uh, grants have come from uh, our, you know, from the, the EPA or uh, our NOAA, our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, that really has supported environmental education uh, locally. And um, that part makes us nervous because those extra funds, because we aren't, we don't, we aren't, we aren't given funds directly um, from the state or um, raised within our own counties and, and districts, but um, those federal funds could be in jeopardy uh, with some of this. And, th and that will be tough because a lot of our partners use those funds or we partner with them um, to run programs and those types of things. So that's, that does make us a little nervous. I would also add, Simon, um, I've put on there a link to the um, North American Association. Um, they've got a new uh, site on their website, um, some, <clears throat> some pooling of research that's been done by Stanford University. And um, what it's showing is um, academic achievement based on issue and investigation um, and environmental education. And so as Maryland moves from implementation into really delivery, because that's where we are now, and, and states, uh, states, counties, districts, school districts um, are, are delivering this, uh, this COMAR requirement, um, I think we're going to see more and more um, of the, the kinds of things that this um, NAAEE uh, site is showing. Um, and it, it, we're getting anecdotal evidence now from teachers who are talking about students who are more engaged in their classes. Um, and I think that what we'll end up with is more uh, evidence-based um, uh, examples uh, of student achievement and, and student really engagement and learning 
um, as they move through the school system with this uh, curriculum in place. Thanks very much, Melanie and Laura. That's a, a really great response. Um, any other thoughts or questions? Shelley has a comment. Um, I wonder, perhaps, Shelley, do you have a microphone? Maybe not. Great. Okay. Well, thanks. I'll read out your comment for us to all to consider. Coming from a nonprofit point of view, I really feel an EE component needs to be a consistent requirement or teachers just won't get around to it. They are so under the pump with other things they need to do. Would, uh, would anyone like to make a comment maybe from your experience, Melanie and Laura, how you've been able to encourage teachers to make time for this? Yeah. Well, well go ahead, Laura. Okay, I was just going to say when we when when the uh, requirement was first implemented or rolled out, um, we had a lot of pushback from teachers, and uh, we've spent a lot of time as a state with a formal and non formal sector to really say to teachers, this isn't something extra. This is and with the curriculum that was put into place, that that definitely made a difference. Um, uh, teachers are now required to deliver this. This, uh, this requirement, um, but it certainly helps to have uh, the EE, the non-formal providers to support the teachers who may not hit, who as we've been saying, haven't had the pre-service training um, necessarily to be able to deliver on this. So Melanie, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I think um, because we're embedding it with curriculum, uh, there is this a little bit of, well, what are we doing? Are we we're supposed to take kids outside uh, kind of response uh, in some of this. So, so, you know, the, the, the pushback has been, um, I think, because it's a change in, in how we think about how we teach. With the new, because the teachers are completely overwhelmed right now with all of the new curriculum. Like I said, we have new math curriculum, new reading and, and language arts curriculum, new science curriculum, and new social studies curriculum. So if you're an elementary teacher and you teach all four subjects, uh, it's tough. Um, so they're they're really, and then on top of that, you say, okay, here, teach the environment too. Though in the way we're like. It's just part of it, right? It, there is that integration. And so what we're trying to have them see is that this is a, the environment is a context for learning and to teach those other standards. Um, so there has, there has been push, pushback on that. Within our district, we're making uh, a, a lot of effort to do professional development and partnering with, with uh, some of our nonprofits to provide professional development for teachers, uh, in what we call in-service teachers, current teachers, um, actually, currently, I'm, I'm getting my uh, doctorate in education, so my study is actually with uh, uh, in-service uh, in teachers and looking at their capacity uh, in regard to um, uh, their confidence in teaching in the outdoors and using the environment. Um, so I'm actually just getting, getting the surveys back now, yay. Uh, so I'm hopefully be done soon, but uh, I'll let you know uh, what I learned. But, but you know, some of the things that I think that we're finding at least, you know, they have been getting some exposure because of um, having these standards and, and implementing this within the curriculum. So they're, they're getting some of it. Um, I'm, I know we'll need more, <laughs> but uh, so we still have a long way to go. Thanks very much, Melanie and Laura. I appreciate that um, something close to my heart is the idea of using this context to explore the interdisciplinarity opportunities in curriculum. And uh, I think that case study and example is such an important way to go. So hopefully your research, Melanie, um, along with some you know, data to understand the situation a little bit better will give us some, some of those examples to move on to. So thank you. Mark, you have a question. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks. For, it's actually more of an observation. Thanks, Melanie and Laura. Um, oh, see you later, Simon. When um, it, and this goes back uh, a number of years uh, to 2001 in New South Wales when they brought in the uh, environmental education policy, which essentially introduced the concept of sustainability to um, to our teachers in our state. We actually found the gap between not teaching it at all and teachers, you know, implementing it really successfully we found that gap actually widened and it was down to two things 
um, pre-service teaching and how com comfortable and confident those teachers were um, about doing uh, great sustainability education in their schools, um, and it can or uh, or how well they could actually integrate it with into their program. So the confident teachers felt they had permission to stretch their wings and try great and new things, whereas the teachers who were not confident or didn't have any pre-service teaching still didn't implement it. And so it was a, a process through programs like Sustainable Schools and our Aussie program and through our environmental education centres that we really had to work on that pre-service and in-service teaching component. Yeah, I think that's incredibly vital. Um, I, you know, and I think that's one of the things that, that we are running into a lot is just uh, just the, the experience isn't there. You know, I mean, they didn't, you know, a lot of our elementary don't have a whole lot of, even in, even in science, you know, it's, it's, you know, they don't, they don't even teach a whole, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's amazing how, you know, we, we set up all this stuff, right? We say, well, this needs to be taught. And then you find out that the principal says that, that, you know, social study doesn't need to be taught because they need to focus on reading and, and uh, mathematics. You know, that's, that's where we are. Um, so we, we know that, that reality. Um, but I think, you know, we have made efforts to, you know, show that this is an engaging way to learn uh, those similar, those same content standards. Um, so it, yes, we, we've got a, I know we have a lot of work to do in regard to working with our teachers. And, and again, that the pre-service piece is huge. Um, we, we would love to have that as part of the pre-service for our um, teachers that come in. Um, but uh, right now they don't have it. A few of our colleges and universities do offer some courses uh, within, within the education department, but uh, it's, it's pretty few and far, be far between. Yeah, thanks, Melanie. I think um, that question is certainly close to my heart. I teach at Deakin University and uh, in the science and environmental education area. In fact, uh, right now I have one of my environmental education units just kicking off. It's week one for us, so it's very exciting. Um, I've just been able to pick up five units dealing with sustainability education that will span the next two trimesters. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of living that passion of, yeah, we're getting it right in some places in pre-service teacher education. But then I will note that all of those units are for our secondary teachers who are going to struggle when they hit the field to find places to implement this kind of uh, important education. And we do have lots of uh, needed opportunity to be found in our primary um, initial teacher education. So it's an exciting space, I think, and, and one where um, there's lots of opportunity still. Are there any other questions for our presenters this evening? Peter, if I could just jump in. Please do, Cam. Sincerely thank Melanie and Laura for their time and effort. It's now 1.30 a.m. in the morning over there, and it was very much appreciated. So yeah, a round of applause, a global clap there. Well done, team. And thanks, Laura. Yes, I'll be talking to Alistair and uh, Samia, and uh, I'll, they'll be able to link to this presentation. Unfortunately, I have another two meetings backing up now, so I'll have to bow out. And thank you, Peter, for fantastic facilitation. Well done, everybody. And this is a, uh, a great concept. We're going to grow and grow with this learning circle. So I'll have to sign out and say bye. See you later, Laura. See you later, Melanie. And thank you, everybody. And uh, don't go, everyone who is not Cam, but thank you very much, Cam. Really appreciate that. Just, uh, just with that handover to think about our next opportunity, um, we do have another one of these sessions planned for June. And uh, with your indulgence in a couple of minutes, I would love just to share with you um, some of the ideas that we'll be exploring in our, in our next session, madly clicking buttons here. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Not sure why I can't hear you. <laughs> yes, we can. Oh, thank you. Excellent. That's reassuring. Okay, so uh, in June, we have a session um, where we're going to talk about eco justice and activism. And I'll be presenting with two colleagues of mine, Marilyn and Sandra, who are both um, interestingly in Western Australia, although at either ends of it. 
and we just really want to explore through conversation these ideas. Um, we have a, a deep commitment to both eco justice and activism, and we want to know why we position these uh, these two ideas. Um, in a, in a post-capital, or how we might position these two ideas in a post-capital uh, capitalism kind of society. We need to think through the ideas of what might it look like and what, uh, what, what are the visions that we're moving, moving towards given the constraints that we're placed, that are placed around us a lot in terms of constant growth. Uh, we recommend a couple of uh, resources that will help um, flesh out our conversation in the next session and we we're excited because it forefronts our national science week which is the dates of 12th to 20th of august given that our conversation is june and fortunately for that particular uh year for the theme this year for science week we have a theme of future earth which is particularly exciting and if you were to look on the national science week website in the schools area they forefront some material there about uh future earth as an organization so um, I just wanted to flash that up and have a little bit of a, this is, this is where we're going. Laura and Melanie, it would be awesome if you would want to join us, but completely understand that that might be a little beyond, um, beyond the stretch of reality, given that it's very late for you. So once again, a, a huge thank you for coming along. Really appreciate your efforts. It's been fantastic. As you know, we've recorded this session and lots of our um, colleagues, friends, members will enjoy um, the participation that we've all had this afternoon thinking about how other countries are addressing issues. And it's always by looking out, it helps us to reflect in. So I really appreciate the opportunity you've given us to reflect on what's going on in our own country. And of course, to, to our participants, um, Dave, Alex, Mandy, and Mark, who are the ones who are still here right to the end. Um, fantastic, and thank you so much for joining. And we really look forward to seeing you in the future. Well, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for all the good work you guys are doing over there in Australia because uh, it's nice to know we have uh, we have have partners and, and other folks that are out there doing this kind of work because uh, uh, sometimes we do feel alone. <laughs> yes, thank you, everyone. Mandy, we can't hear you. Oh. <laughs> If the, it, maybe you could click on the microphone button. Sometimes it needs you to join the audio. No, that mutes you. Try again. Oh. Is that better? Oh, you're just very quiet. Maybe if you speak really loudly. I'm sorry, I was a bit late. My busy brain didn't register the time difference. So I'll look forward to looking at uh, checking out the recording. Fantastic. That's a great idea. And it should be up really soon. Uh, as I said, our, our Natasha is amazing. So as soon as Mark gets his editing done, I'm sure we'll have it uh, up on our YouTube channel and then on our website. I, I just want to say thank you. It really was um, great uh, to have met Cam last fall uh, at the World Future Council meeting and to be able to hear what you all are doing. He was able to share some of that um, at, at the meeting, um, but it really, uh, I think is so important to keep a global perspective in terms of environmental education and uh, the, the future that, that we're trying to support for our, for our young people. Thanks. Thanks, Laura, thanks very much. And I, um, just will note that Dave's, Dave's made a point that it'll be two hours closer next year, so next, uh, next learning circle, so it won't be, won't be quite so late for you. But anyway, greatly appreciated. I'd uh, love to stay in touch and, and hear from you. Melanie, love to hear about your research as it comes together, so please do share that with us. Um, thank you to everybody for participating, and we really look forward to seeing you at our next learning circle or before. Mark, would you like to say anything to close? I'd just like to um, say a big thanks to everyone as well. Um, these are the sorts of conversations that I love to have with colleagues. They, re they enrich the work we do. So thank you. Um, and it's lovely to have Alex here, who's just, you know, just embarking on this journey.
Yeah, and I met with, I had the pleasure of meeting Alex the, just the other day. So thank you. Thanks everyone. <laughs>